you go, yeah. They're, they'll switch to Netflix. There's too many internet entertainment options. Um, so I was sitting there, like, the first time it happened, what can I do? And I looked over at my backpacks of the gear that runs on Speedify. You paid for a year of it. You can use it on any computer or device. So I just pulled out my uh, one of one of several uh, hotspots I have, hooked mm-hmm. it up, cranked up Speedify, and it has never been a problem since. We used the Speedify software at a command line level. Uh, so it's it's not running a whole UI which is starting to drain resources. It's really very, very base level. Um, and the really clever people at the BBC got it all working. And we're now doing, we're now presenting uh, whole, whole programs every single day of the year have been presented using this technology. Uh, all our weather reports from our, our, our weather presenter are done on them. If I look back at my original lives, they are awful. They're terrible. But we all start somewhere and we all get better. And every time you go live and every time you get on camera, you're going to get a little bit more comfortable. You saw part of it? Cool. Nice. (laughs) All right. We are famous. You want to say hi to everybody? Now you're on the video. It's a wave. That's the camera right there. Nice. All right. We are going back to look at this guy's house. It has a lot of white lights. There he is. Hey, Christian. Hi. RGB mixing, so if you want to do each color, you can mix them independently. Within the app, there are a couple features, and I'll just go and show you this. See power. There we go. Woo! Oh my god, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's just building budget aesthetic gaming PCs. And I have my, my studio here now, so we, we've graduated away from the basement of my house and whatnot. Uh, also, I would say streaming kept me from going completely insane when I was in that hotel room for two weeks when I first got to Australia. Uh, so raising awareness is really going to help break that stigma. Uh, we definitely have a stigma in our society where it's you know not okay for folks to be open about their medical conditions. It's kind of seen as shameful. We have, the, all of us have these amazing cameras, Apple, Samsung, Google. We have customers come in all the time who say, oh, I watched this stream and I came in from out of town and I knew we had to stop here. Uh, we build custom PCs for a lot of content creators, uh, gamers, you name it, businesses, colleges, esports. And then I do a lot of thought leadership talking and trying to educate the industry on the value of techifying, as I call it, their events and been doing that for a long time. The first two years of live streaming was actually just myself. I was kind of acting as a community manager. You know what? I never used to think that people wanted to sit, care, cared about what I wanted to say, but now I, I actually, I'm like, you know what? I care. Just, I care, gotta, Gina. <laughs> you've got to put it out there. You've just got to put it out there and someone will listen. I used to actually be solely mobile. So I used to teach people how to edit using KineMaster, which is just a mobile app. Really, really cool app. And I love the process of both. I love. Uh, the editing process, the scripting process and things like that of recorded videos, but nothing for me also beats the buzz that you get from pressing the go live button.
Welcome, welcome, welcome! It is Speedify Live, and I'm your host, Alex Gizes. And this is the live stream about live streaming, brought to you by Speedify. This is the show where we practice what we preach and take Speedify Live, and we talk to you about how to be a better live streamer, how to moving at this stuff, how to, you know, not have DMCA takedown notices on your videos. Uh, so, we're going to dive into that in just a little bit. Uh, before we start, we are live. So, you know, give us a follow or subscribe, whatever, wherever you're watching this. Mash the appropriate buttons uh, so you'll know when uh, we have new streams coming. Uh, also, tell us who else you'd like as guests. We have all sorts of people. We have live streamers. We have people from, you know, software companies, hardware companies that make, you know, stuff related to live streaming, which is who we're going to be talking to today. Uh, so tell us who you'd like to see. Tell us what streamers you're watching. We can get them on. Uh, our special guest today is Jesse Corwin, the Chief Marketing Officer of Slip.Stream. Uh, this is an amazing service. They have a website, and the URL is slip.stream, uh, that has a mission to help, you know, bring together creators and musicians so that creators, you know, people making videos can, you know, get great music for the background on their videos. They can get sound effects and stuff and not have DMCA takedowns because the musicians are being paid. Um, so it's really cool. Um, they have all sorts of content. They have, you know, celebrities involved and, uh, 40% 40, 40 of their customers, I understand it, are actually gamers who are live streaming. So this should appeal to you guys. So before I bring Jesse on, uh, let's take a uh, little look at what they do. That was awesome. <laughs> hey, Jesse, uh, good to have you here uh, on Speedify Live. How have you been? Appreciate it. So do you mind telling us just a little bit about yourself first before we dive into the company? Who are you? Sure, yeah, of course. Uh, I'll try and make it uh, super interesting for all the viewers and you. Um, yeah, I, uh, let's see, I, I, I was a uh, failed musician uh, like many, uh, entrepreneurs and people who start music companies. I had uh, dreams of being a rock star and uh, attempted it uh, in numerous bands in my 20s in New York City. And, um, you know, along the way, worked in media um, and had the good fortune to uh, have a friend of mine start, uh, two friends of mine actually start a, a music company called Jingle Punks, um, which started in the Lower East Side Basin apartment and grew into one of the the top uh, independent production music companies in North America. And I started running sales for them and then eventually became managing director. And um, yeah, we sold that company uh, twice and licensed music into over 4,000 shows and ads. And I think what was probably most gratifying was sort of, we kind of fulfilled our mission of establishing a class of musician where, you know, we had seen how difficult it was to make a living as a, as a musician, it, the, you know, the number of people who get huge record deals and become ultra famous and ultra rich are very few and far between. And I think, you know, providing licensing opportunities for musicians and, you know, seeing people that we knew who were in bands that we played with, 
uh, you know, makes, you know, a side living out of it in addition to their normal income is, is really awesome. Um, and so nice. I think stream is a, is a continuation of that, um, you know, and it, it's really Cool. So when did you actually start Slipstream? Slip.stream? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got to work on that. <laughs> um, yeah, we started it um, in, well, we started it, really launched it in August, April of 2021. So there was some, you know, obviously things that went into getting it off the ground before then in terms of like financing, product development, but um, the beta launched in April of 2021, um, and, you know, we've just grown exponentially from there um, and, you know, are enjoying, you know, the, the fruits of our labor and just continuing to, to work hard and, and build an even better product that benefits creators and musicians alike. So, yes, yeah, super, super uh, proud of it. Nice. Um, so did you start with a specific niche of music or...? No, because um, well, there's three of us who, who co-founded the company, um, and one of the, my other co-founders, Dan Demol, um, was one of the founder co-founder of Jingle Punks. He and I together obviously had a had a strong background in music licensing and publishing, so we uh, you know had the good fortune of being able to acquire catalog that could sort of, sort of get us off the ground, uh, so to speak, yeah. as and sort of added to it um, and. Yeah, so it was really the intention was we, we knew that, you know, hip hop and electronic and dance music and pop were probably like the most searched or sought after genres. But we knew also from our experience that there are certain types of tracks that are more cinematic or transition type music that I think would benefit the creator economy. And so we really sought to kind of give a have breadth and depth at the start i mean obviously this is a huge problem right the licensing of music right people want music and i think for the most part people are willing to pay for it but it's almost hard to figure out how to do it right i've had videos be taken down for copyrights and i'm like who, how do how do i give 30 bucks to the music company for my stupid video right yeah. like i want the video up the music is what the music is i'd, I'd pay for it <laughs> yeah it's um it's a really complex problem, right? I mean, you'd think um, that the music industry and the tech industry would come together to make it easy for people. Um, but the truth is that I think the nature of copyrights um, and music copyrights in, in specifically, um, it's very complex. There's an entrenched set of owners and established uh, systems that are not super congruous to uh you know benefiting creators so yeah. i think while that's uh you know a problem it it, it creates opportunity for companies like ours yeah i i, I think a lot of the problem probably is that the, the tech company thinks they want to take 90 percent of the money and give the creators 10 percent, but then it goes to record companies and they want 90 percent of the money <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, so that's why they, they can't work it out. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that there's sort of when it, when a, when a platform launches, they, they're not going to go and cut a deal with rights holders out of the gate. Right. And so they kind of wait until there's like a tipping point of users, right. The, the labels and the publishers don't come after them right away until they reach this sort of tipping point of, of, of adoption and then they come in and say whoa 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 you're using our copyrights and you need to pay us yeah. and you know there's a negotiation that happens and i think yeah it's it's again this is in the world of like big business or whatever you want to call it people should be having the creators both musician and 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 creator top of mind but it's very much kind of two massive entities <laughs> negotiating how much they have to pay or not pay one another. Yeah, yeah. All right, so just a reminder, uh, chat seems pretty quiet today. We are live. If you have questions for me, questions for Jesse, uh, post them in the comments and we will respond. Um, so actually, yeah, let's, let's talk about music. Uh, and probably, actually, maybe we should start with you explaining the DMCA for those who don't know sure. what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the DMCA stands for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It was 
basically like I, I can't remember the exact date of the last amendment to co the, the original copyright act but it's probably like 100 years ago or whatever and then you know congress uh you know had to sort of answer for like hey how do copyright holders make sure that they're not getting stolen from uh, in regards to the internet right so the, the dmca the digital millennium copyright act was an amendment to the original copyright act that helped copyright holders and owners adjudicate their copyrights on the internet right. that is the purpose of it and i think consequently because people have get these dmca takedowns they sort of vilify the dmca but it's kind of misdirected because the dmca actually protects the, the copyright owner that's yeah. all it is it's the way that those you know. the one thing i see people demonize it about which is apparently right is that there is no penalty for making false claims yeah i mean i, I think that well now there's like now there's that, copyright silence <laughs> and yeah. we just get a bunch of people's videos taken down <laughs> right. well, i think that, that speaks to the challenges of of monitoring and policing the content right so the platforms have that safe harbor law where they go, hey, you can't come after me because we didn't post it, our users posted it. And so, you know, and then they've eat, there's not some uniform system uh, that, you know, both creators and copyright owners can work together through. They're sort of these individualized systems specific to each platform. And so it makes music on the internet sort of not interoperable and it makes it confusing and it creates problems and none of these things are perfect and things like you just mentioned happen. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. So how does Slip.Stream solve all this? That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, here, here's the honest truth, right? Like there is no perfect system. You know, I think any company that tells you a hundred percent, you're not going to get any, there's no takedown ever. It's just not true because the systems are not perfect. And I like to be, we operate with rigorous standard here. But the way that we protect people is we um, have a multitude of different kinds of contracts in order to get the right kind of music, the, the right rights, right? And provide them to our users. So we fully own things where we control the, the, the entire copyright. We have licensed music where we control the digital rights or the content ID rights to that music. So we have the ability to adjudicate those things on the internet. And, and then we build in a lot of sort of protections to our users where we have them, you know, uh, allow lists to their channels to, to, to give us more um, uh, visibility into where these things are used, being used um and yeah i mean i think that's all you really can do and then you have to have an amazing customer support system and be really empathetic to the creator to help them navigate um what is just unfortunately an imperfect system i think everyone's trying to work together to to find solutions but you know that's how we approach it i think it's just to be human to try and give people what they need and then if problems come up treat them as you would another human and help them the best that you can. And, and then have build the relationships on the platform side to make sure that we're, we're protecting people. Right. Cool. So from a creator's point of view, I come to your website, mm -hmm. I sign up for an account mm -hmm. and then, I mean, talk me through it. There's big catalog of music. Yeah. So, um, we have, uh, over a hundred thousand songs and sound effects in in the system um and um over sixty five thousand songs right and now approaching almost sixty thousand sound effects i think um and so you come to the site and you have the ability to create an account and browse the library browse the music there's a section uh, a free library section where if you create an account with us you're able to um download and use that music as long as you provide attribution. Um, and then there's different kind of payment tiers where if you want access to the full catalog of sound effects and songs, you're able to have different choices of those kind of subscription models that work for your budget and work for the kind of content that you want.
So that's that's generally how it works. It's pretty pretty straightforward. So I just download the music I want. I use it in whatever software to make my videos. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have we have different partnerships with different companies I, on the live streaming front. Um, you know, we we have an app in Streamlabs. Um, we're developing an app just for OBS in general, an OBS app. Um, in 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 talking to uh, other companies that are focused on streaming. Um, but then you know, I think people use our web app in a, in a bunch of different ways, right? Um, they um, they either stream it directly from the web app or they download it and edit um, into whatever sort of editing software. How do creators provide attribution? Good question. Um, there's an information button for each song and in it there is a, an easy methodology to copy and paste the, uh, the attribution information and then you paste that in your video description and or chat, or um, you can put it if you want in a link in bio, but most people I would say put it in the video description, uh, comments or, or, or chat if they're, if they're streaming up Twitch or something like that. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. So from the musician's point of view, oh wait, and then there's a last slide for the creators. Then you, you connect like your YouTube and Facebook accounts somehow to your slip.stream account and yeah what, what is that what does that do yeah so again i mean there's different systems that are used to police copyright uh, infringement on each platform um so for example with youtube they, they have a con system called content id um, we have access and visibility into that system and so by providing the youtube channel or channels that you're using uh, our music on it allows us to um, make sure and ensure that you're, you don't receive any claims, right? And then if you do receive, uh, you know, an erroneous claim, we're able to uh, release that claim quickly and easily. So it's just a layer. It's a layer of protection. Do you get the claims at that point? Do you respond to them first, or is it still going back to the creator? Um, uh, there, there's a pro. It, it goes to the to the usually it goes to the creator first. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of users on the platform. And so typically, um, there, if you go into our FAQ, they, they, they sort of lay, we lay out the process. Unfortunately, it's not like YouTube has their own process of how you do it as well. So even if we did see it first, we don't really have the ability to um, release the claim in, without the creator taking some sort of action. So you have to dispute it. You have to put a reason why, oh, I have a license um, and then that dispute then, you know, is registered and then we're able to release it and then all, all is right in the world. <laughs> okay. So from the point of view of the, the artists, the uh, musicians, yeah. so they, they come to you and they've got music and they've got beats and stuff. And uh, what's the relationship look from their point of view with you? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's a point of differentiation between us and some of the other libraries, which is we're very artist centric, right? I mean, um, we all have a background, not only in music publishing and licensing, but with relationships in artist management, label and traditional pub, pub side of the business. And I, we feel like one of the reasons we started the company was because we look at the creator economy as a real opportunity for, uh, independent artists and musicians and even established artists and musicians to market their music, gain exposure, generate more streams, generate more revenue. Um, and I think for us, it's really about creating equitable and fair compensation, and giving musicians the opportunity to get exposure and revenue through, you know, this, this sort of explosion of, of, of creators. And so consequently, when they come to us, you know, I, I don't think every single one is a right fit for us because some people just aren't comfortable with the proposition of letting unfettered use occur in UGC. But I think there's a lot, uh, you know, we've confirmed it through the people that, you know, the, what, what's happened so far that there are a lot of people who see the power of it, right? And so I'm confident that it's only going to grow from here on out. Yeah. So Super Tech Grover asks, do you stream yourself? Do you ever I stream? I don't, I don't. I'm, um, I, you know, 
it's funny, like before- Write music I, anymore? Do you do any music if you don't stream? I, I, I play for my children. Um, I have a, I have a 12 year old and a six year old, but two, two boys. So yeah, I, I, I the 12 year old likes it when I play the six year old does not. <laughs> um, I would have and, expected the opposite, right? That the 12 year old's yeah, getting um, too cool for dad. Yeah. <laughs> they think i'm pretty cool considering i work with gamers and in streaming yeah but i yeah i don't stream we, we have a lot of people in the in the company who do i'm the sort of uh the, the one who's who, who doesn't but i'm more on the music side of it i would say and i i that's sort of where my touch point is with artists and musicians okay um so you guys got some big names involved right riot and sony yeah uh, like was that you? You? Uh, how, how did you guys get them involved? Yeah, I mean, it was collectively as a team. I think you know. Again, that's I think what what separates us from the other companies is that we have these sort of music and entertainment relationships at our core, right? Um, we we know how to navigate those worlds, and we have the ability to I think advance the conversation with people who have been traditionally. A little bit reticent to 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 kind of get involved and so i think i mean riot obviously is not one of those they're at the forefront of this i think as a publisher and what they do musically they've really i think helped us and informed our pov but um yeah we just sort of like were able to get a, a conversation going just hit it off our our missions aligned and you know Sometimes serendipity is, is good. <laughs> um, with Sony, um, there, that was more based on sort of longstanding relationships. And then just, again, having sort of that like-mindedness and alignment in terms of like a, a, a forward-looking vision. And I think their investment in us is it's pretty significant, right? It's um, really the, the first big three to make an investment in a company like ours, which I think shows that traditional labels and publishers recognize the power of the live streaming and, and creator economy space as it relates to like what what can do for music and artists yeah yeah pricing is a funny thing right because i don't know background music you know sort of interchangeable but then certain hit songs are, are like so valuable you know, and so you guys sort of have this flat model, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it's okay. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's right. <laughs> yeah, meaning it's easy for the creator. To, yeah, I mean, are, 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 are you, are you, you don't have a point of differentiation between a T Pain song and then like some other background track. Is that is that what you mean? exactly? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like again, like it's easy to get dazzled by the pinstripes a bit. I mean, I think people want to use like amazing music from their favorite artists, no doubt. That's what they want. But I think that there's plenty of people who they may not say this or think of it top of mind, but they need a transition whoosh or they need a quirky comedy cue or they need a sort of pensive tension cue that builds up. Like if you watch Mr. Beast, I mean, it's just like orchestral percussion and like TV type music, right? And so I think that there's a there's a wide need in terms of music and, not, and therefore getting into the game of slicing and dicing, one thing costs more than the other. I think that complexifies things too much. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, you just want to get people paying. And, and probably people show up needing one or two little things. And then they discover there's all these other wonderful things and now you've got them hooked, right? <laughs> I think that, yeah, they don't, uh, you, we, the goal isn't to make these one-off sort of transactions, right? It's to enable people who are continuously creating to have a ton of choice to make their content stand out and be even better, right? Like that's what we, our mission, <coughs> excuse me, is to help creators streamers, musicians stand out from the crowd and become superstars. Meaning we want their creativity to have no bounds, to have no limits and to just help them improve and get better and, and make the best content they can. 
All right. So I see the audience is growing. We're now a couple hundred people watching. It's becoming more interesting as the time goes on. That's right. Uh, So, hey, I'm Alex, and uh, this is Jesse from uh, Slip.Stream, and we are talking about their service for, you know, they help musician, you know, they're, they get music together, right? So they have all these musicians, they put together tracks, and then you as a content creator making videos on the internet, uh, you can get them from them and you avoid, you get this huge library of awesome music and sound effects, and you don't get DMCA notices anymore because you're legal, they're getting paid. Um, so that's really cool. And we're live, so if you have questions, post them underneath and we will answer. Um, Yes, you mentioned T-Pain. I mean, there are a bunch of announcements. He joined your board of advisors. Um, it's really cool. Yeah. So how did how did you guys get hooked up with him? How did you catch his attention? Um, well, our chief uh, music strategist, Anthony Martini, um, who had worked with us in our last uh, company, had a, had a relationship there. <laughs> and I think when we were talking about how do we signify to the market that we are serious about bringing real artists, real creators, big artists, big creators into this ecosystem of, of Slip.Stream? And, and T-Pain, I think, you know, has always been at the forefront of things musically, but also I think from a creator standpoint as well, right? He has a really significant following on Twitch. He's been, he was really one of the first uh, musical artists who sort of, saw, you know, crossed over into gaming and live streaming and sort of took it seriously. And you've seen a lot of other people follow suit. And he also, by he, he had created something called the Pizzle Pack before we ever started our company where he had received DMCA takedown notices and he had heard from people and his fans that they had received takedown notices. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do something about this and I'm going to take these tracks that are mine, that I own the master, I own the publishing and I'm going to make them uh, available for use without, you know, fear of getting copyright claims. And so knowing that history, it just was a no brainer to reach out to him. And luckily he, uh, he, he understood what we were trying to do. And, and you know, he's been an amazing asset for us and, and just thrilled to have him. Yeah. Cause he's got all kinds of stuff up there, right? I mean, he, he, he has the packs of beats and stuff you can use, but then he also has full songs, right? With, yeah 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 those are i mean he he's subsequently released um three volumes of the pistol pack um and then um he made available um some of his latest singles through us as well and there's a lot more in the works you know i think again <clears throat> you know when he when he used autotune uh you know people maligned him for that but now if you listen to I mean, almost every song <laughs> at least every song in hip-hop has some sort of part with autotune in it so he's always been ahead of the curve and i think that will be proven true once again uh with what he's done with the pistol pack and hopefully by joining the board of our company nice and so is he really active i mean board advisor sometimes that's roll up the sleeves and get busy and and sometimes it's you know just yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean there's a lot of things you know he he released an album and was on tour so i think you know he's been working on that but we 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 work really closely with him um you know he's always super supportive of us i think you can see that on his uh socials you know he's always reposting and get, showing us love there he advises us on certain things. He gives us intros to certain people that we need. Um, we just released them um, and we had an artist drop with uh, one of his gamers on his gaming org, Nappy Boy Gaming, which is named Big Cheese. So, you know, I think just having his aura around the company is a benefit. And yes, he's an amazing singer without auto tune. That's right. I, so, then, so then it is an artistic choice to use auto-tune as opposed to some people where <laughs> if you watch i mean look I, I you know you kind of maybe maybe you second guess that if you like first heard him but have you ever seen his, his tiny desk concert you, you know he can sing so yeah that's right um so do you guys work with the artists at all or the artists will just kind of separately do their things and upload their tracks um sometimes it's like um there's creative direction given it depends it's it varies you know i mean i think um <clears throat> yeah it just varies some people have albums ready to go where they're like hey i have all these tracks they're not it you know 
I want to make them DMCA free. I want to provide them to creators. How do we get them into your system? Um, other people, um, you know, we work with and say, hey, here's the kinds of music that we're looking for, but fairly hands off. Like it's not really meant to be, you know, like a traditional grill building, composing songwriting house. I mean, yeah. it's a little bit of that, but I think we don't want to dictate the same way. We don't want to dictate to creators what to do. I don't want to dictate to musicians what to do. I mean, I can inform them on trends and what we think will work in the system, but I'm not getting in the way of anyone's creativity. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, but I guess you do end up realizing what's missing from the collection, right? I mean, do people tell you that and then you... Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, look, you you know, I think when you build a tech product, you have to listen to the user, right? You make all of these assumptions about what you think people will like and want to use and invariably you're wrong about a lot of it. So I think being humble and making sure that you're shoulder to shoulder with the user is super important. So part of that is obviously listening to feedback about, about tracks and then obviously looking at usage and making sure that we're keeping the, the uh, catalog fresh and up to date and getting lots of new music in. So, you know, we're, we have like hundreds of new tracks going in every week specifically to sort of combat the inevitable library fatigue that people find when they <laughs> are in yeah, a system. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's a the best song and then everybody uses it, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a double-edged sword because you, 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 on one hand, you could say, oh, everyone use this, like, get rid of it and put something new. But then even the people who complain about not seeing new stuff, they still want that song that they always like to use to be in there. And if you take it out, they go, where did the track go? Like, I want to use it. So, you know, I think you, you, you try and do the best you can to curate, um, you know, and make sure that things are, the things that people want are there and then there's new stuff as well without it being super overwhelming. Right. Um, so how do you enforce the attribution, right? So some of the, the songs the, the licensing term, right, is that you need attribution to say where you got it from. Are you yeah. guys somehow checking that people actually do that? Um, you know, at this point, we, we there's not real enforcement, I wouldn't say. You know, I think that it's really about, um, for me, it's really about saying to people, look, you're getting this song for free, right? Like mm -hmm. the attribution enforcement is mainly on the free tracks. And yeah. so there's this sort of like, gentlemen's yeah, you should absolutely like hey you're getting it for free the least you can do so that people don't think you're you know a jerk is give attribution i think that we will i i think enforcing attribution is is important and it's something that i think we're looking into but i think the priority is more about sort of protection against claims right than it is um than it is that do the right thing people <laughs> somebody gives you free music and just want credit for it give them the credit yeah. not, i have to say hard. people do right and, and 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 to be fair a lot of that was precipitated by the users asking us hey do we have to give attribution and so like i think that that is it's just it's just com it's just common decency and i think that for the most part people want to give the attribution that's what yeah. i would say so but having to be isn't really yeah yeah g albert says jesse i'm just now reviewing your website very clean very informative very welcoming looking forward to a deeper dive oh, all thanks. right i can't take uh, any i was i was playing with it earlier today it's, it's I'll, really let the, uh, I'll let the product <laughs> and the marketing team know. <laughs> <laughs> um hmm. so Stuff like apps, is it all just a website? Is is there a, a desktop app on the way or, oh, you, you uh, mentioned, you mentioned was, plugins to some of the video. It, it's a web app. It, I mean, um, you know, I think the, 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 in our view, the, the, the era of mobile apps sort of, at least for this kind of product, I think, um, has, you know, become a little dated. And so our view was look, web app you can access on the phone in any sort of device makes the most sense. We've received requests for a mobile app. Um, some of our competitors have made mobile apps. 
I won't say never say, you know, never say never. Maybe we make one, but I think for now it's more about just making sure that the web app and any sort of integrations into other platforms work seamlessly and efficiently. So that's sort of. Yeah, I think you want to, I think that would make sense. You want to be in other people's app, right? The, all yeah, those yeah. videos, all those, you know, you want to be an Ecamm, you want to be an OBS and all that stuff, right? Right, right. Or like, you know, an integration into Adobe Premiere or like editing exactly. software. It, I don't think people are like, man, I really want another app that I then have to go to. <laughs> but yeah. I could be wrong. The, the, the market could tell me differently. So, yeah. So Ryan is asking, how did you guys get connected with Clicks? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, a really good friend and former employee of, of ours from, from the Jingle Punks days, uh, Alex Strasmore, who's now head of talent at Icon Agency. Um, shout out to Alec. Um, I asked him to help us and, and work with us to kind of get more visibility and entree into the talent world in gaming. And he introduced uh, me to a uh, gentleman named uh, Michael Feldy Feldman, uh, who was Flix's manager. And yeah, we were able to secure a really first of its kind deal, which, you know, hit a huge milestone this week. Um, we released a track um, a week ago with Clicks, Gunna, and FN Mecca, and it just hit a million streams inside of a week. So, um, nice. you know, our our goal with that and with working with Clicks was to prove that the attention that these uh, you know superstars command really can help them expand their what they do beyond just sort of gaming or streaming you can expand what they do into the music world. And so, you know, Flix is, he's, it's, it's amazing to see sort of how intelligent and just talented these kids are, right? I mean, I'm 44, not to age myself, but like, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's just wild. Like when I was a kid, it was like, oh, I'm gonna be a filmmaker. And now, you know, I think Cody started when he was like, 14 or 13 i can't remember and it's like they their access to these tools to, like yours you know to make content to reach out to all uh, the world really it's sort of bred this like this you know new era of creator where their skill set is just so fast it grows so fast it's it's just mind-blowing so yeah very cool nice. glad to be working with him so what do you see as the, the what what are the challenges for slip dot stream right what do you guys still have ahead of you <laughs> yeah uh, it's a good question i mean i think the biggest challenge is for any new company is establishing a brand that has meaning right um and i'll say that because i'm the cmo so that's my personal challenge within the company i'm sure the other uh guys will have, would tell you other challenges but for me i think Nah, their jobs are easy. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's 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 a fairly mature market, right? You have Epidemic Sounds and, and other companies like that where their brand has been around and is sort of the, like, the main brand that everyone knows, that everyone's accustomed to. And so I think when you're a challenger brand uh, to use some advertising lingo, you know, that's like that that that's really tough to do and so the only way you can do that i think is through you know investing in sort of a long-term brand building strategy to like give the brand meaning and in the way that i look at that is being in places that help creators right because the core of it is like yes we want to we provide music but the the intrinsic value that we're providing is helping that helping people right and so any way we can do that um, is important to us as a company. And I think ultimately will get us to where we want to go. But that's our challenge is building this brand that has meaning in the community. Nice. So any roadmaps that you can share with us? What are cool things that are coming? Um, secret. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some sort of, uh, there's some things I can't talk about and some things I can, but I think for us, um, you know, one thing that we, we recently participated in and we're going to continue working on um, less live streaming focus, but is um, with Creator Now. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Eric, the, the YouTuber. Um, 
he created uh, a film academy uh, specifically for, for people who aspire to be YouTube stars. And so we were part of that um, uh, session uh, recently and they're just growing exponentially. I think they're doing really, really cool things run by his manager, Zach Hornivar, an amazing team over there. Um, and so we're going to be doing more there. Um, and then I think the main focus is just keep improving the product and getting better music. And I think you're going to see like this track that we have with, like I just mentioned with Gunna, there's going to be a lot more mainstream artists, bigger creators, giving back to the community and letting people use amazing music. And I think that's really where we provide the full value. So yeah, that's, that's really the, the, the short term roadmap, but obviously the long term one is, uh, domination. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, international issues. I mean, DMCA obviously is a, a U.S. law. I mean, do you guys have artists from all over the world, creators all over the world? Are there yeah, I mean, issues there? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, we are internationally focused. Um, there are things in our roadmap that are international minded that I am playing. I, I won't expand upon, but yeah, I think there's our eye is always looking at the burgeoning markets, you know, for the next wave of creators, I think. There's a lot of interesting segments around the world that are maybe a little bit less mature from a creator economy perspective than, than North America, but have a lot of promise and a lot of growth potential. So 100% looking internationally and care about those communities. Yeah, yeah. I guess pricing can get tricky again with internationals. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I think localization is the key. Um, but um, yeah. It's, it, it's all complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're getting worldwide rights from the artists. They're happy to have you. Sell that? Stuff everywhere. You're getting worldwide rights from the artists. Yeah. They're have to. to. You sell it anywhere in the world. Yeah. yeah I mean, look, I putting it on YouTube, what, what else can you do? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we live in a, a global culture now, right? We, um, and I think that I, I don't, I mean, I have yet to encounter people that want to geolock their track in any way. Right. I don't think people, I don't think the, I young, guess it's just a movie company thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the younger generation thinks of it like that. Right. And then, especially if you're an artist, I mean, look at it, Spotify alone, ingesting 80,000 songs a day. My old band's music is on Spotify and my kids think like, oh my God, you made it. And I'm like, yeah, but no one listens to it. Right. <laughs> I think the artists have that state. That's the challenge for artists. Hey, because of the democratization of distribution to DSPs, you're everywhere, but you're kind of nowhere because you're there, but you're in a sea of millions and millions and millions of songs. And so how do you get people to know about you and, and, listen to you and our thesis is the more you let people use your music the more people get to know who you are and listen to you. and yeah. so especially if you get that attribution right <laughs> yeah, and look we, we also have we also pay a royalty for like if you put your music behind the paywall we mm -hmm. have a royalty pool that we pay out to our musicians so they make money by getting exposure they make money is it based on the number of plays or based yeah. on Time it's, a, it's it's just downloads, right? So it's pro rata uh, based on downloads. And so, you know, our, we're, we, we endeavor to be the most equitable company to artists or to be the most beneficial company to artists, you know, and I think our deals reflect that. And I think that the power of the platform will reflect that as well. Nice. Uh, a question from G. Albert. Jesse, I see that you have a presence on Facebook. Are you using Facebook for folks to collaborate? Are you guys also using Discord? Yeah, I wouldn't say that we're very Facebook focused these days. Um, I think the primary way that we collaborate um, is, I mean, collaboration, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but I mean, in terms of like communication, I would say, you know, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitch, um, Twitter is, is, is Twitter and Instagram being the biggest, we do have a discord, um, which we're going to be doing some amazing stuff on. So discord, I think is, is unbelievable. And I, 
me personally, I, I have plans for us to really build that out because I just think it's, it's just a great community building tool. It's a great way to communicate what's new and exciting at the company. So if you're looking for a way to collab, please go to our Discord and join it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah, we have a Discord and we don't take it as seriously as we should. <laughs> it, it a lot of like nurturing, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's different than, uh, than other, you know, social platforms, right? I mean, Twitter, you can, and, and IG, you can come up with sort of different kinds of posts and have a posting schedule, but I think anytime it's really more conversational, um, you know, generating that conversation takes a lot of care and nurture. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. work. It's worthwhile. Yeah. I think our technical support is kind of worried about things getting out of hand with people yeah. showing up asking questions about Speedify. Well, <laughs> yeah. they mean, like, you know, we've, we've got chat on, you know, you can go to my.speedify.com and there's a chat thing in the corner and you can chat with support, but they feel like that's much more controls than. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I haven't gotten blowback from the support team yet, but I, my, like I said, I think being a shoulder to shoulder with the customer is the most important thing. It's the only way to make the product better and to, make the user experience better so if we're inundated with a lot of questions and stuff i think we have to build systems to answer those efficiently and so we'll see we'll see but so far so good you know but we're we're gonna have a lot of cool events in there and i just i, I think there's i think it's going to be an amazing uh platform for us all right uh super tech rover any new things about speedify oh question for me oh, yeah. real quick New version of Speedify beginning this week. Um, oh, my stream deck's not working. Oh, there we go. Uh, here it is. The really so right now this is running on my Mac, and it is combining three internet connections. I'm plugged into Comcast cable modem, and then I have two cell phones. So if anything goes wrong with the Comcast, this video doesn't get messed up. And actually, if you look at the graph over there on the left, there's a big block of time where the the pink shows up because it did kick in and save me. Um, so the neat thing is that Speedify now automatically recognizes cell phones and stuff and marks them as, you know, try to use them a little, a little less than cable modems and fiber optics. It's just, you really don't have to touch any settings anymore. You plug it in, it realizes, oh, this is satellite. Oh, this is a cable modem. And it just sets all the settings for you and just gives you more reliable internet, right? I mean, you saw that graph, something went wrong. My internet got seriously messed up about 10 minutes ago. And I think nobody noticed. <laughs> so that's what's fun with Speedify. Uh, internally, so we were just talking about talking to customers with Discord and stuff. How do you guys communicate with each other? Are you an email company, a Zoom company, a Slack company, Discord uh, inside the company? We are, we are, uh, mostly Slack and zoom. Uh, I would say, um, I am not a huge fan of, uh, the remote work environment. I like being around people, but it is what it is. So, you know, zoom is, is an important tool. Um, and, and Slack is, is obviously, uh, like that's, that's sort of like the touchstone of the company for all, all, all the departments to communicate with one another. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, we're Slack and then Google Meets. Although, I mean, who knows? Yeah. Google keeps reinventing them every three months. I assume at some point they'll reinvent them to be useless. And we'll... yeah. <laughs> um, oh, another one from G. Albert. Great. Several groups that I'm engaged with are also making big transition into the Discord. Uh, great area for live streamers to collab, create, troubleshoot. Plus, you don't have to deal with Facebook. Yeah, yeah. You know, for a while, Speedify and stuff, we were doing a lot on uh, Facebook, and it was really working for us. And then you could see they were every time something was working for a company, they they cut it off, and suddenly add a new, you know, a new advertising product. You know, if you want to give out coupons, your customers don't see it unless you're buying an ad to give out coupons. And it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> there, there was sort of no way to make progress without handing them all the money, right? They just kept asking for more. So. Yeah, I think, you know, for a long while, um, paid marketing on Facebook worked really well, right? It was really cost efficient yeah. and targeting was insane how sort of specific you could get. And 
I think that whether you want to call it greed or business practices or what have you, coupled with, you know, the iOS 14 update really sort of made it a lot less efficient for a lot of people. Um, and I think for us, our customer tends to be um, younger. So I, I don't know if Facebook is really the, the best platform for us. Yeah. But there are a lot, I think from like an enterprise and uh, commercial subscription perspective, where we work with small businesses, freelance professionals, I think for that it really is valuable. Yeah, nice. All right, uh, we're coming up on the hour here. Um, so, slip, slip dot stream, right, is, is the URL. Yeah. Um, somebody posts in the comments, people get the link. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. You, you guys should check it out. Great way to get music. Yeah, we love um, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mash the buttons. I interview all sorts of interesting uh, streamers and stuff. Uh, next Tuesday, it's uh, You Were Found. The... Uh, I saw him in the comments here, but, uh, you know, travel streamer. And then next Thursday, he and I will go in person to Longwood Gardens, right? So the old DuPont estate, South Philadelphia, uh, they have turned it into an amazing garden. Uh, so we will wander around, use Speedify to combine internet connections and uh, you know, show you neat flowers and show you what kind of tools we both use when we're, uh, you know, streaming and traveling. And that should be interesting. Uh, and then on the 30th, we have Dream Poet for Hire. Uh, this is the guy I met in a, that live stream when I was walking around West Philadelphia. And there was the poet with the typewriter. <laughs> Turns out he's a super interesting guy. We're bringing him in the week after next. Uh, it'll be really cool. Uh, so, Jesse, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. This was awesome. Uh, slip dust stream is a really cool product and I'm, you know, I'm glad you guys exist. And, uh, yeah, I think the more you get plugged into those tools, I, I know you know this, but like Ecamm, OBS and stuff, they should, you know, there should be a music option. <laughs> Trust me, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> and I uh, thank you so much for, uh, having me on. I really appreciate it. You know, I love what you guys I've built, I love this this uh, initiative you have to kind of do your own streams and walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So That's super right. to be here, really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night, and I'll see you all online. Cheers.